I do. My kids. We all sit around tables. It's awesome. Um, how many of you? Well, that's beautiful. That's not distracting. How many of you can touch your toes? I did. Stand up. Give it a shot. I'm fighting, right? This is like this is one of the highlights of my life. Like I wake up every morning and I'm like, watch this, because. <laughs> Prior to, prior to like a year or two ago, I can't remember the last time I was actually able to get further than this. And people people would say, hey, come on, try. And I was like, all right, I'm trying. Oh! And now, boom. I just take it for granted. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. In 2013, I entered one of the darkest periods of my married life. Uh, in January, Diane miscarried. And when you miscarry, I think you, it, it's, such a, it's such an emotional devastation that you, it's like you get hit and then you kind of start falling later, you know? Because at first all the platitudes make a lot of sense, like, oh, God is good and he's going to work this out and blah, blah, blah. Maybe the kid would have, you know, and it satisfies you. And then in, um, in May of that year, I hurt my back worse than I've ever hurt it before in my life. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible is in Romans. It says, at just the right time, God. And it's so true. Because 2013 was also the year that I started full-time working with the Dallas MK. I quit my job in March and started my new job in March. And I immediately hurt my back. And man, if I had hurt my back when I was still trying to drive the van... I don't know how God would have provided for my family because I was on my back for months, it felt like, visiting the chiropractor twice a day. And at just the right time, God put Diane and I in a car for an hour to two hours every single day, going back and forth to the chiropractor. And that's when we started talking about the miscarriage. And the darkness started lifting a little bit. And we, we developed an intimacy that would not have been able to happen otherwise. I honestly believe that. And then in um, July, I you know I hurt my back in May, and then in July I went to Jamaica and sort of hobbled around while I painted a house. <laughs> and this thought started festering in me, and it really came to a head in um, in late January, early February of the next year, 2014, as I was sitting in Thailand. And I, I'll never forget it, man. I was sitting in, um, because I, I don't know, like I would lay on my back and I would set a timer for 20 minutes and I would get up and I would just see if I could make it around my love seat one time. And then I would collapse in utter agony on the floor. And this was my life for months, it felt like. And so I'm sitting here in Thailand and I'm just, I can't do anything. I'm hobbled most of the time. I can't play soccer with the kids. I can't. Do it, and I just sat there and I said, God, how am I supposed to be a youth pastor if I can't even play with these kids? How am I supposed to do what you called me to do if my body is broken? And God started teaching me stuff about what He wanted me to be. He reminded me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where He says, Man, I take the foolish things and you qualify to shame the wise, and I take the weak things and wow, you really qualify to shame the strong. And He started building into something. You know, Bella was born a year later after I hurt my back and fell into that, that pit of darkness. And we processed through the miscarriage. A year after that, the next May, May 2014, Bella was born. And it just felt like this burst of light entered into our, our, our family life. And then um, I remember going back to Jamaica a year later in July. And I'll never forget um, just the sense. It was like one of the most intimate times of worship I had with the Lord. I I, we, we were building a house and mixing concrete all day long and lifting heavy cement blocks. And like we, if we had like a, a just one little, those little bulldozer things, like a cat or whatever, we would have been done in like half an hour. But instead we like had like buckets of dirt that we were like, we're okay. Next. So we did this all day long. And I remember, you know, during one of our rests, just getting up and just picking up trash because I could do this again. So I could pick up trash. And I remember shoveling cement all day long in buckets and never wanting to put the shovel down because I felt like, I 
like, God has healed me. And it just brought me back to that period of time in Thailand where I was just, how can I do when God said I'm doing something? And so I think one of the, one of the questions I wanted to start this time off with is what would you be right now today? Who would you be if, if you looked at your life and were able to erase all of the suffering and all of the darkness out of it? What would be left? My sister is someone who I think has suffered more than most people I know. She, she suffers with incredible physical pain on a daily basis. And she went through a period of time where she was unable to see anybody for countless, countless months. And I've talked to her about that. And she has said over and over again, I wouldn't trade any of it for anything because I know the Lord now in a way that I never would have been able to know him otherwise. So I want, I want, uh, if I had more than 25 minutes, I would say, at your table group, talk about that question. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. So remember that question, and as you're eating delicious food later, talk about that. What would you be without your suffering? I think of this verse. It comes, comes from Psalm 66, 8 through 12. Psalm 66, 8 through 12. Thank our God, you nations. Make the sound of his praise heard. He has kept us alive and has not allowed us to fall. You have tested us, O oh God. You have refined us in the same way silver is refined. You have trapped us in a net. You have laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. That sounds so painful. <laughs> we went through fire and water, but then you brought us out and refreshed us. And that somehow encouraged me, even though, I mean, it's like, wow, God is take, takes us sometimes through this period of testing on purpose. And when I think about the suffering in my life, you know, I just went through this, um, this week-long trauma healing workshop. And, and one of the things I got out of that is, there, you know, they say that these are the three causes of suffering in the world. The first one is the fall. The second one is Satan is our enemy. And the third one is... Your bad choice. No, our bad choices. <laughs> My bad choices. And I feel like when we go through these experiences of suffering, what separates the Christians from the non-Christians is that simple progression that we, we read about in Romans 5. It produces perseverance. And so we stand and we persevere. That's what God desires. As we persevere through the suffering, then something happens. We develop this, this character. I was thinking about my, my grandmother just passed away earlier this year. And I was trying to think of a really cool quote. And I remembered I did a paper on Rich Mullins when I was in college. Because I love Rich Mullins. He's my favorite. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, he has a quote about legacy. He says, you know, I think if you, if you have an ambition to leave a legacy, what you leave is a legacy of ambition. I think the only time you really leave... Any, a legacy we're talking about is when you try your hardest to get closer to God. And, and you devote yourself to Him. I think that's the only time you really leave a legacy. Well, of course, I was looking at lots and lots of quotes. Another quote popped up that is just priceless. He says, you know, when David went out and killed Goliath, I don't think, you know, he was out to kill a giant. He was just trying to deliver lunch to his brothers. And Goliath got in the way. I love that. <laughs> So recently, I was reading through the story of David. And I thought, this is so fascinating. He really was just trying to deliver lunch to his brothers. And no, it's all like it is. And I think the point is, sometimes we can get so, like, we can almost romanticize the idea of suffering. Like, if I'm a Christian, I need to be suffering. And, I, and then we make it more about suffering than about God. And we think suffering is so great, and look at what it produces. And, but no. Suffering is a byproduct of a relationship with God, but not, the, not what we're called into. And so David is going, and he's not thinking about killing the giant. He's just doing what his dad told him to do, and he's delivering these sandwiches, and he's noticing that Israel is kind of, I don't know, cowardly? I don't know what he's realizing, but he's like, you guys, I, 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 a couple of things stood out to me, like 40 days, Deliath is here, taunting Israel. And then, I guess God gave them ample time to like stand up and you know, do something about it. Here comes this little shepherd boy who has complete and total faith and confidence in God, and he comes up. And I just, I love the idea of David saying, whoa, 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 what did you just say? <laughs> and just getting really upset about it. 
And one of my favorite lines is, is this. He says, you know, you come against me with spear and sword and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord, our God, the God of armies. And then he says, and I love it when they do this in movies, you know? When the hero's like, first I'm going to shoot you, 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 and you, and then I'm going to da, 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 and then they're like, what? And then he does everything that he just said. <laughs> That's exactly what David does to Goliath. He says, first I'm going to knock you down, then I'm going to cut your head off, then I'm going to do all this stuff. And Goliath gets all upset about it, and then he does all those things. <laughs> Foreshadowing of all the Hollywood movies to come from that story right there. Anyway, <laughs> the bottom line is what it made me think of is like, we as Christians... I mean, we need to have that attitude. You come against me with back pain and miscarriages and suffering, but I come against you in the name of the Lord my God. And that just beats whatever else you're coming against me with. It made me think, you know, we live, we live and, and it's been talked about already today, we live in community. And, and when I think of community, I think, of Lord of the Rings, of course, first. So, you know, <laughs> I was remembering the two towers, and that's one of my favorite, like when I was thinking about boldness against darkness, you know, that scene in the two towers where they've been driven all the way back in the deepest part of Helm's Deep, and Theoden is just almost out of despair. What do you do against so much wickedness and evil and hate and Aragorn? And this is what really I thought was cool that stood out to me this time. Aragorn not only says right out against it, you know, because that's the big, well, right out with me. But he notices, he looks up, and he sees light shining in the window. And he remembers what Gandalf had said. Look for me at dawn on the fifth day. I'm coming. I left, but when I left, I didn't leave you. I promised to return. And I think that gave Aragorn the courage to say to Theoden, Ride out! Ride out with me! And they rode out. And then they flanked the horse. And then the trees got really mad too. Anyway, <laughs> it, was really, it was really cool to think about this community, this idea that we are, we are in it together. And the days that were so dark for me where I was just laying there, just like, man, I can't believe this. How am I supposed to do this? are the same days when Diane would say, Caleb, you're going to get through it. One day you will hobble even better than you're hobbling now. <laughs> Maybe you can walk again. You know, and one day you'll touch your toes. Mm. I was talking with Pete about this a little bit, and he, were, he, he, he gave me this picture that I then looked up and researched a little bit of, uh, you know, the tallest tree on earth is uh, that, the red... Redwood. Thank you. You know I something important. It's the redwood. Tallest tree on earth. 350 feet. No taproot. In fact, the roots are some of the shallowest of any tree. They, go, they grow 6 to 12 feet. That's it. So why don't these trees fall over? Because they grow, right, they grow really close together. That's one of the cool things about these trees is they grow in very close proximity to each other, and then they hold on for dear life. And the community of roots is what enables the trees to stand so tall and survive. And it made me also think of this study I heard. I didn't research this again, so maybe it just be, I don't know if it's real, but the study I heard done about they were growing trees in biodomes, you know, and the trees kept falling over. They're like, why are the trees falling over? And they realized, well, the trees are falling over because they don't establish good roots. Why don't they establish good roots? Because they don't have any wind in those domes. They don't have anything that pushes against the tree that causes the roots to dig in deeper. And I thought, man, one of the things that God is trying to do in our lives is to make us firm, strong trees that endure. The purpose is to endure, persevere, have that character. Maybe think of some other verses. Proverbs uh, 6, 20 to 23. My son, obey the command of your father and do not disregard the teachings of your mother. I thought this would make the parents really happy. Um, <laughs> Fasten them on your heart forever. Hang them around your neck. When you walk around, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you wake up, they will talk to you. Because the command is a lamp, and the teachings are a light, and the warnings from discipline are the path of life. That's how we get filled with light. Proverbs 12.3, a person cannot stand firm on a foundation of wickedness, and the roots of righteous people cannot be moved. 
Proverbs 4, 18 through 19. But the path of righteous people is like the light of dawn that becomes brighter and brighter until it reaches midday. The way of wicked people is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. And finally, Proverbs 10, 25. When the storm has passed, the wicked person has vanished, but the righteous person has an everlasting foundation. I think when we talk about darkness and light, we think about Superman, right? Because Superman gets his power from the sun. And that was an image that really stood out to me when I was preparing for this. I don't know how many of you have seen Superman Returns. I'm not really saying it's the greatest Superman movie ever made, but I am saying there's a scene in there that I think is really worth watching. And if I was really well prepared, I would have you watch it right now, but I'm not. <laughs> but I could have been. Should have been. Anyway, the idea is Superman um, uh, flies onto this island that Lex Luthor has created, and it's like made out of pure kryptonite. And so he lands on this island and he confronts Luther. Because when Luther creates the island, it displaces all this water that's then flooding the mainland. And Luther's idea is I'm going to make all these Krypton islands and I'm going to take over the world. Okay, it's Superman. It sounds really weird when I'm saying it. But anyway, <laughs> Superman lands on this island and Luther uh, grabs a shard of kryptonite and stabs it into his, uh, his side and kicks him off into the water. And so he's there kind of drowning in the water. And Lois shows up in her little plane. Well, her, her husband's flying the plane. Anyway, they pick Superman up out of the water and they fly up. And Lois notices that he has kryptonite in him. She pulls it out and she throws it out the window. And then he gets up. And she says, well, what are you doing? He says, I have to go back. She says, you can't go back. You'll die. Of course, he's like, yes, I can, Lois. Anyway, so then he, he opens the, the plane and he flies up above the dark cloud cover and into the sun. And he's just in the sun, just absorbing all of the, the power that he needs. And the, the, the real cool part is that, like they, they zoom in on his fist and then they make up this cool sound that a fist might make if you can clutch it really hard. And it's like, and then you see this like resolution on his face. You know? And so then he's, he's gained all this energy and strength and then he like flies back down and he's like shooting fire out of his eyes and he flies deep underneath the, um, the island, the kryptonite island, and he flies it up into outer space and throws it away. But it takes every last bit of energy and strength that he has and then he falls back down to the earth and then later wakes up in the hospital. You know, and I love that because it shows community. Even if you're Superman, you need people around you who will care for you. And, and, and even if you go up and get all this energy from the sun, and even if you're doing everything right, that doesn't mean that what God is asking you to do isn't going to be so hard that it's going to leave you incapacitated to a, to a degree. He created us and intended us to live in community, just as Christ was in community with God in the Garden of Gethsemane before he did the thing that cost him his very life. And it made me think, you know... It's so beautiful that God gave us a community to live in, but it also made me think, you know, when we go through dark times, our, our tendency, our reflex is to isolate ourselves. And sometimes I think what we need to be building into our lives is a community of people, roots of people that will make sure that we can't do that, who will protect us from doing that, from crawling into the dark places you know, and forgetting the taste of bread. That's why I'm glad you're eating after this. Um, but that made me think of something else. Sometimes, you know, the darkness can be circumvented in really funny, silly ways. Like a good, a good nap, maybe some chocolate cake, Amen. <laughs> maybe, maybe listening to your favorite piece of music. One of the things I love about the story of Moses, you know, is that Moses would go and spend time with God. And then he would come out, and he's like a human flashlight. You know, people were like, wah! Could you put a veil over your face, please? And I think sometimes when we confront darkness, we get this idea that God needs to fix something wrong in us. And of course, there's lots of stuff wrong in us that God needs to fix. But what I love about that picture of Moses is Moses just was content to be with God. 
And I think that's one of the things that I like to take in my tool belt when I'm going through times of darkness. Is God, I, I can't even begin to even handle you fixing me right now. Can I just be with you? Can I just sit with you? And take all the stress and pressure and burden of having to accomplish something off of me. And just curl up in your lap and know that through proximity, I become bright. And I go out and Diane's like, oh, they don't look not good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, you know, and that, and that does remind me of my favorite Rich Mullins song, which is, when, the, when my body lies in the ruins of all the lies that nearly ruined me, will you pick up the pieces that were pure and true and breathe new life into them and set them free? And when it's all over, can I be with you? Can I just be with you? And I think the, that heart cry within all of us is what, is, is what that, that character that God is producing cries out for. And that is our hope. That is our hope. Our hope is not in, wow, I have a very happy life with my wife and my family, and if I can just get past this, I can touch my toes. That's, that's nice. That's a blessing. That's not my hope. My hope is that through all of this, I get to be with God. I get to be with God. And it makes, me, it makes me feel better about these people who I know live in this horrible suffering. Like my parents just came back from CAR, and they're telling me these stories of these, these awful things that have happened to these people way off in the village, way off in the bush, you know. <coughs> terrible, terrible tragedies. And I think about my life and my back problems and the miscarriage, that, and, and I just think, it's nothing compared to what these people went through. But the gift is the same. The gift is not me being able to touch my toes, and the gift is not me being able to escape the war, and the gift is not having a comfortable life with my family. The gift is God. And that's what he teaches us. I am the gift, and so you can be equally as rich off in the bush having gone through this awful tragedy because I'm there, mm -hmm. and I'm the gift. Amen. And you can be e equally as destitute and, and devoid of everything here with a comfortable family and friends who love you because you just don't see that I'm the gift. The gift that gets you through the darkness. I wanted to end, uh, my, wanted to end my time today by reading this passage from Mere Christianity that I just love. I just, I just love it. It's stunning. I think all Christians would agree with me if I said that though Christianity seems at the first to be all about morality, all about duties and rules and guilt and virtue, yet it leads you on out of all that into something beyond. One has a glimpse of a country where they do not talk of those things, except perhaps as a joke. Everyone there is filled full with what we should call goodness, as a mirror is filled with light. But they do not call it goodness. They do not call it anything. They are not thinking of it. They are too busy looking at the source from which it comes. May it be with us.